Welcome back everyone. We're here for the third and final installment of the non-communicable diseases lecture. You'll be happy to know. So thinking about our non-communicable disease toolkit, the last lecture section, part two, we spent a lot of time talking about screening programs and how we evaluate the uh, performance characteristics of a screening test to figure out if it's going to be useful to us or not. And, and that was lengthy, so thank you for your patience. So what we're going to talk about in part three here are the risk factor interventions, the importance of looking at cost effectiveness, as well as prevention of potential harm or long-term harm from treatments. We're going to talk a little bit about genetics and then just mention research. So risk factor intervention. So this is going to include identification, so perhaps screening for or finding particular risk factors as well as treating them. So actually, I would like to change that to identification and treatment, but here we are. So let's get into it. It does a really nice job talking about the importance of multiple risk factor interventions for cardiovascular disease, so heart attack and stroke. And so I really encourage you to read that section in the textbook. I'm just going to give you a few highlights. So one of the incredible strides we have made in medicine and public health over the last 50 years is understanding the importance of different risk factors for cardiovascular disease, in large part due to the Framingham Heart Study, which there's a brief media assignment about, um, but also many, many other scientific studies. And what we're looking at here is a graph that shows you the hazard ratio or the likelihood of having a cardiovascular event, so a heart attack or stroke, depending on what your blood pressure is. So I'm going to use the highlighter here to just show you a little bit of this. So a normal blood pressure for your systolic, which is the upper number, is usually somewhere around 120. And you can see that in this region of blood pressure, your risk of having a cardiovascular event is quite, quite low. They're using a hazard ratio here. But look, if your systolic blood pressure is up at 150, wow, you're like one and a half times as likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. That's a 50% increase in risk. That's really significant, okay? So they identified first that elevated blood pressure was a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, for atherosclerosis, for heart attack and stroke. And then they did studies to say, okay, well, what if we do things to treat people's blood pressure? If we have them exercise more, if we have them eat a healthier diet, if we put them on medications and through our interventions lower their blood pressure, does that also lower their risk of cardiovascular events. Now you might think, well, of course it would, but that's not always a given, interestingly, in, in medicine and health. But yes, in fact, and there's studies they found that when you intervene and you treat the blood pressure through diet, exercise, and medications, you also reduce the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. This has been huge. We didn't know this before then. Um, and it's made a huge difference in our ability to improve the health of the population. So most of you have only been alive for a couple of decades. I've been alive uh, twice as long or so, more uh, as many of you. And but so you're pretty used to seeing a lot of messaging around things that are heart healthy. So be physically active, eat a healthy diet, try to maintain a healthy weight, don't smoke. Um, and then if you develop high cholesterol, diabetes or high blood pressure, make sure that you manage and treat those things. This is all relatively new in the last several decades. And what's really cool about it is that it's been phenomenally effective. This is one of the, the huge, amazing stories in public health. I, I We should be screaming this from the rooftops. So I'm going to show you here. So this shows premature death from uh, heart disease over the years. And so we start off in the late 60s. And so this plain line is men. So 300 out of every 100,000 people per you know year were dying prematurely, so dying young from heart disease back in 1968. So as we identified these risk factors and started putting interventions into place, look at this amazing drop. 
right? So it has gone down to about 100, right? So it's decreased like from 300 to 100. That, that's huge. That's an enormous decrease in risk of premature death. When I was young, people in their 50s and 60s were dropping dead of heart attacks all the time. Now it still happens, but it's rare. Okay, and so the different lines are looking at different population groups. We can see that men have the highest incidence still of premature death, as do African Americans, which is this line here, right? As we've mentioned, your gender is a risk factor for atherosclerosis in part one. So you can see that women are this line down here, right? So just biologically, they're at a lower risk, but we've also made improvements in premature death from cardio from heart disease in women over time. So all of these interventions, diet and exercise counseling and education, smoking cessation efforts, treating high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol, as well as some advancements in the treatment of heart attacks, right? That has also been a part of this picture. Our ability to do stents and angioplasty uh, has significantly improved. But um, a lot of this improvement in premature death is due to risk factor modifications. Okay, so that's my little blurb on risk factors. Let's talk about cost effectiveness. So what makes something cost effective? Now, in general clinical care, so when you go to see your physician, for the most part, when they're making clinical decisions, they're going to look at benefit versus risk. If you come to me, I diagnose strep throat in you, I'm going to say, okay, should I prescribe penicillin for this person or not? And I know that if I give you penicillin, that there's a significant likelihood that you will get better from your infection more quickly. And, but I also know that there's a rare but non-zero likelihood that you could have even a potentially life-threatening allergic reaction to that penicillin. So I'm constantly weighing the risks and benefits, looking for net benefit. In medicine, hopefully your physician is also thinking about cost, right? And I'm not gonna give you a fancy schmancy, super expensive antibiotic to treat your strep throat when good old penicillin for about 10 bucks will work just as well. Um, but it's a little bit less depending on where you train of how you think clinically. And a lot of our decisions in clinical medicine are just based on benefit versus risk. So looking for that net benefit, does the benefit exceed the risk? But at a public health level, we have to think about the fact that our resources are not unlimited, right? We have a finite number of resources. And so how do we make the best use of those resources? In other words, how do we get the most bang for our buck? Right? We want to make sure that we're getting the most we possibly can out of how much we're spending. So how much does it cost for what size of a net benefit? So we're going to be looking at cost, but we're also going to be looking at the size of the net benefit. If it costs a lot of money to get a little bit of improvement, well, that's not going to hold up as well as paying a lot of money for a big improvement. Right. So we're going to look at both things. And so one of the metrics that's used to do this is called the quality adjusted life year. And so that's equivalent to giving you one additional year of full health, right? So um, in the strep throat penicillin example, it's maybe costing $10 for you to get three more days of full health. <laughs> right. Um, so it's, you know, 10 bucks for three days, you know, less than 1%. So 1% of a 0 0.01 quality adjusted life here. Right. So is that worth it? So we usually use a value of about $50,000. Um, that is kind of based on our mean, you know, per capita gross domestic product. It's kind of weird, but that's the amount that's generally used in public health to justify uh, whether something is affordable or not. If it costs $50,000 or less per additional quality adjusted life year gained as a result of that um, intervention that you have put into place, then that is felt to be cost effective. So this will vary a lot. There are a lot of things that we do in medicine that are not particularly cost effective, and there are a lot of things that we do that are super cost effective, especially at the public health level. All right, 
So um, in your media assignments, there are two videos that talk a lot about cost effectiveness, so make sure you pay attention to those. So our next bit in our toolkit, our next tool is making sure that we prevent harm from treatments. So remember when we talked about that PERI framework, the problem, etiology, recommendations, intervention, evaluation, we're always going to circle back with evaluation and make sure that what we're doing is helping and not harming. So an example where we didn't do such a great job, but public health helped us out, um, would be the opioid crisis. So the opioid crisis actually started when medical providers started prescribing a lot of opioids. And this was in part due to good intentions. So there was a big campaign called PAIN, the fifth vital sign. And the national organization that oversees accreditation of hospitals said, you know, gosh, you've got people coming in to, to see the, the doctors and they're in terrible pain and you're not treating their pain. They're leaving the emergency room or the office and they're still in just as much pain as they were when they came in or during the course of their hospitalization, they're in a lot of pain. We're not doing a good job addressing people's pain. And so there's this huge campaign of pain as the fifth vital sign. Nurses now had to assess pain levels in people routinely and regularly throughout their um, healthcare stays. And People were you know, held accountable if your patients frequently had very high pain levels and you failed to address that by prescribing pain medication, for example. And in fact, when I was in medical school in the late 1990s, we were taught as long as we were treating pain, patients would not become addicted to opioids. We were taught, as long as you're just using it to treat pain and you're not just giving it to somebody willy-nilly, as long as they're truly in pain and that's what you're using it for, don't worry, they're not going to get addicted, they're not going to get dependent. We now know that we were being misled uh, by the pharmaceutical companies that had a lot of money to gain from us prescribing these medications. And, um, and that in fact, there was data that showed that a lot of these people would become addicted or dependent on medications. And the pharmaceutical um, companies had that data, but they kept it from us. Uh, so unfortunately, what happened is a significant proportion of patients who were prescribed opioid for pain became dependent or addicted. So, um, so this is doctor's fault. Right, because um, we prescribe these medications uh, much more widely than we ever had before. For good reasons, we were trying to address people's pain. Um, but thankfully, public health was collecting data, <laughs> right? And they were like, you know what? Actually, a lot of these people are getting dependent and addicted. And so once we realized that, of course, we made a change in our prescribing habits. And so we, we stopped prescribing opioids so freely, became much more restrictive in to whom and when and how we would give these medications, which is good. But we had all of these people who were dependent and addicted now that couldn't get the medications from their doctors. And so most of them turned to heroin. And then um, when the newer synthetic fentanyl drugs came on the black market, on the drug scene, started using those as well. And so now we see a lot of overdose deaths due to heroin and fentanyl and fentanyl analogs and street drugs, um, which are not regulated by the FDA. You never know what the strength is. You never know what the dosing is. Um, and so we have a big problem on our hands. We don't want to do that. Another example of preventing harm, this time from a screening program, is um, cervical cancer screening program. So we realized in the 1970s that doing pap smears on a regular basis could identify cervical cancer in its early stages. And when identified in its early stages, we could treat it and have much better outcomes than if the disease had progressed. So it ticked a lot of the boxes for an effective screening program. And in fact, cervical cancer death rates or mortality have dropped significantly, as significantly as premature mortality from heart disease due to those interventions due to pap smear screening.
And so initially, it was recommended that you should have a pap smear every year starting at age 18. As public health agencies and epidemiologists continue to collect to collect data about this and assess how this program was going, however, they noticed that for people who were under age 21, there was no net benefit. And they also noticed that in young people, that screening every three years was actually going to produce a higher net benefit because of a decrease in unnecessary following follow-up testing, which itself was associated with harm. So once we learned all those things, the screening recommendation changed to once every three years, starting at age 21. So the more we know, the better job we can do uh, improving health and preventing harm from our interventions. So super grateful to all the data scientists that have helped us to realize, hey, we can tweak this and do an even better job by our population. Next, I'm going to talk briefly about genetic testing and counseling. This could be an entire course on its own, so we're just going to briefly hit on a few things. So there are three basic ways that we currently use genetic testing. So genes, of course, are segments of your DNA that you inherited from uh, your parents, one or the other of them, and they are the set of instructions for how your cells will behave. Right. And so certain variants of certain genes are associated with certain diseases or are associated with increased risk for developing certain conditions down the road. So we can use genetic testing in some cases to predict the risk of somebody getting a particular disease if we have enough information about genetic testing for that condition. One example is the BRCA gene. Now the BRCA gene was named that because it's associated with a higher risk of breast cancer if you have this certain variant of the gene. And so we've realized that if people have a really strong family history of breast cancer and therefore a high pretest probability of having the abnormal gene, testing for it can help identify those folks. And in some of those people, they have more than a 50% lifetime risk of breast cancer. Answer. So in some of those folks, then we're going to recommend, hey, maybe you want to get a mastectomy, right, at some point before you, you know, get into your 40s or 50s to prevent you developing breast cancer down the road. And so that's been really helpful and really powerful. Notice, however, that we don't test every single person uh, because the accuracy of our test is not awesome. So if we tested the entire population and had a super low prevalence, we would have a lot of false positives, right? So we don't test everyone. We only test people with a strong family history. There are some genetic markers that also seem to indicate whether you're at slightly increased risk for some other types of cancers or for heart disease or some other things, but we don't have really excellent ways of kind of intervening or knowing how that's going to translate for an individual person's risk. Um, so this, this kind of testing is still rather in its infancy. It's, it's not, some of it's ready for prime time, but a lot of it, we're not quite there yet. Another way we can use genetic testing is to see which drugs or medications might work best for a particular individual. And there's a lot of people who are really excited about this and are talking about, you know, kind of individualized medicine based on your particular genetic profile. And this one is even more in its infancy. So I would say there are a couple of medications for which we know for sure there's a specific genetic marker that can tell us, wow, this person isn't going to do well with this medicine, or this person's going to do much better on this other medicine. There are a few, but again, we're kind of just getting started with this. So more to come. The third, and the one that I think is... Um, most directly relevant because it's most in use is genetic testing when it comes to reproduction. So there's two basic different ways we can do this. One is carrier testing. So let's say I want to have a child. I'm done with that. But let's just say I'm younger and I'm thinking about having a child with my with my partner, right? So Perhaps there's a family history of a disease like cystic fibrosis, and that's a condition where you can be a carrier. And if your partner is a carrier, you might end up with a child then who has the disease. 
right? So if you're both carriers, then the child could potentially have the disease. So you can be tested for that. And so in fact, cystic fibrosis is an example of one disease for which people who are thinking about getting pregnant or are pregnant can opt to get tested to see if they're a carrier. And therefore, um, if they are, then they, their partner gets tested to see if they're a carrier. And then you can think about testing the baby, right? Um, so that's pretty interesting and it can be really important. So there are some genetic diseases that are fatal. Uh, for example, Tay-Sachs disease is something where the children who are born with the condition rarely live past age two. It's a heartbreaking disease. It is more prevalent in certain uh, ethnic population. So Ashkenazi Jewish population, for example, has a very high prevalence of uh, Tay-Sachs disease. And so this testing can be really, really important. They have a whole uh, system for basically checking before people even get married. If they're both carriers, it says, uh-uh, we don't recommend it, right? Because we really want to prevent this devastating disease from occurring in the potential children, which is fascinating and has lots of ethical implications and psychological implications. So that's carrier testing. Another type of testing we can do is prenatal testing. So prenatal, pre means before, natal means birth. So testing the fetus when it's still inside the uterus to see if it might have a potential condition. The one that we're most familiar with is testing prenatal testing for Down syndrome, which is trisomy 21, where the fetus has an extra third, or a third uh, chromosome 21, and it's associated with some medical problems, low IQ, and characteristic facial features. And this is also an ethical issue because it is not something that we can treat or cure. And so the decision or the reason to get tested then can help families to prepare that they would be having a child with Down syndrome, but it also sometimes is used uh, by couples to make the decision to terminate the pregnancy. Uh, so we need to think really carefully about how we use gen genetic testing and in what ways. The last tool in our toolkit is research. This is by far the biggest of all of them. It is research that allows us to characterize the problem of a certain disease or condition, and then look at the distribution of the disease and identify contributory causes and the etiology. It is research that allows us to then hypothesize and make recommendations for what is likely to be effective at addressing the problem. And it is also research that helps us to figure out how we're gonna do the intervention. How are we gonna put these things in practice? How are we gonna make it happen on the ground? And it is research that allows us to evaluate how well our interventions are working. So research is a huge part of that entire PERI process that we've talked about in the evidence-based public health lecture. It's also a huge part of how we discover and develop new tests and new treatments. So we constantly are looking for improved tests, right? We want, especially if they're screening tests or diagnostic tests, we want the test performance characteristics to be just as good as possible. But we're also looking to develop new treatments um, and better understand diseases for which we don't currently have treatments. So research itself would be, you know, a three year course. Uh, so that's all I'm gonna say about that for now. So in sum, for non-communicable diseases, we have screening programs and all the factors that go into the test performance characteristics and what that means in terms of positive and negative predictive values for an individual patient. Risk factor interventions have made enormous strides in our reduction of disease in the population. We're also gonna to look to see if something is cost effective and a wide use of our wise use of our resources and make sure that we're not accidentally causing harm, right? The, the road to Hades is paved with good intentions. We wanna make sure that things are actually working as intended. And then there's the piece about genetic testing, more to come on that. There's a lot already in use, but um, it's still in its infancy. And then the importance of research in everything that we do in public health and in medicine. So that's it for non-communicable diseases. Communicable diseases will be next.